Hello, beautiful people. It's Quinton from the Hunters of Light. And today we are talking to Kate Jonker. Kate is an accomplished writer and underwater photographer from Gordon's Bay in Cape Town. And we are going to go through some macro photography, uh, some hints and tips, talking about her equipment uh, and just seeing some amazing, amazing images. I absolutely love the, the way that she approaches her underwater photography. And I'm sure you will too. Um, also, hopefully you get inspired by this. Um, go out, buy an underwater housing, shoot some underwater photography, post it in this month's competition so that you can win that amazing 100 mil lens. Uh, if this is the first time you uh, are visiting us on the Hunters of Light YouTube channel, uh, please remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. For those of you who are coming back to watch again, oh man, fantastic. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You guys rock. Um, if there's content that you want to see that we haven't uh, put up yet, haven't uh, focused on, let us know. We're happy to create content around what you guys are looking for. So uh, yeah, guys, cue the intro. All right, Kate, technical issues aside, uh, you know, I've, I've done this so many times that uh, one would think that by now I would know, uh, you know, to, to switch things on, make sure they're working, etc. cetera. Um, and I, it, one thing that, that um, I can definitely say about underwater photography um, is that from my understanding, if there's a technical issue like um, you get down 10 meters, whatever it is, and you realize that, oh, this is not switched on, you can't just... Uh, make an adjustment, switch it on, and and you sort it. You've got to go back up again, um, and and then do whatever you need to do. Come back down and carry on. Um, so fortunately, in this environment, um, water is not as much of a problem. I could just uh, s switch on the thing that I should have switched on in the beginning. But um, Kate, I'm I'm very excited to to have you on today. Uh, I, I checked through the the entries this morning with the the, the macro competition, and there's not a single underwater creature. Uh, uh, image that's been entered. So if you if you enter, you could win the lens uh, sponsored by Canon. Um, but I'm sure once people see, oh hold on, I forgot, I've got some underwater shots, they'll start entering and uh, and that sort of thing. And I'm I'm really excited about the fact that I've got you on because I think people don't really see underwater photography as macro per se. I mean, I I you know it it it, it was obviously on my radar because I'm looking at a whole lot of macro photographers for for the creative showcases. But people think bees and praying mantises and snakes and and that sort of thing. But there's never really a, a, a you know a, a, a thought of oh well you know what I've got a couple of great nudie branches or anemones in uh, in my portfolio. So that's why I'm really excited to to see what uh, what you've got to tell us today. Um, so firstly, welcome. Thank you very much for, for your time and your energy. And, and maybe you can start off by giving us a, a, a bit of a breakdown of, um, of where, how you got into this. And, and then we can see some of your amazing images. Yes. So I started diving in 1999 and I met my husband through diving too. He was an instructor and we followed each other around and dived together for many years. And in the end, I said to him, listen, diving is your passion. Instructing is your passion. Why don't you start your own scuba diving business? And so in 2009, we set up Indigo Scuba Diving Centre in Gordon's Bay. And I just followed him with his students and took photos and videos of them whilst they were on their amazing journey of learning to dive. And I tried to take photos, but they were so shocking um, I didn't know what settings to use. They were green, they were blurry, they were absolutely awful that I, I kind of gave up and I just took videos. So I think in the space of about a year, I made 80 videos and my video technique was great, even though in those days, I don't even think GoPros had been invented. Right. Um, and then I think, I, think I, I just felt, listen, don't give up. You've got to take photos of things under the water, not just divers, but the most amazing marine life that we have here um, in False Bay, which is just outside Cape Town. And I picked up a book, um, Underwater Photographer by Martin Edge, and I read it from front to back, and it suddenly all fell into place. Um, I did study underwater photography when I was at college, but land photography and underwater photography, is oh, they're so different. You capture the light completely differently. Yeah. Your settings are so different. And so when I understood what the settings were for underwater photography, I realized that, hey, I can probably do this. Now I understand how it all works. And I took my camera and I went underwater and it just all started working for me. 
um, at that stage, I think I was using um, a Canon, um, what was it? A, a Canon S95, which is, okay. was, it's a, a nice compact, you can use manual settings. So I was just diving around with this Canon in this housing. Um, I was setting the ISO, the aperture and the shutter speed so that I could get enough ambient light into the pictures to to freeze motion, but also to capture the image correctly. Um, so I wasn't using any artificial light, no strobes, nothing. Okay. And then, so I went on a deep dive and I thought, no, I can't get enough light into this camera. I need to use a strobe. And a strobe is like a flash that you attach to the camera. And where your flash of your camera would normally go off, it actually triggers the strobe. And then the strobe fires and it just lights up everything under the water. And I thought, oh, my word, you know, I, I, now I know how the camera works and I've been diving without a strobe for about a year. Just adding that strobe just brought the colours and the textures and the details of these marine animals to life. And for me, that was the huge turning point of, of underwater photography. And I think that was in about um, 2012. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the thing with, um, with, with all uh, genres of uh, photography. I think once you, uh, your initial hurdle is, is, is learning how to use the camera and what settings and, and uh, exposure, etc. cetera, um, then, you know, you think everything is fantastic and you, then you add a, a, a flash uh, and, and yeah, you know, but then you add do something with the flash, like put it off camera that comes from a direction, and all of a sudden there's like this, you know, the heavens open, and it's like, oh man, I can't believe this. Um, and once once you get to that point, um, I think things just uh, fly from there, you know. So I can quite uh, see how when you're saying that, uh, you know, you you once once you put those strobes on, it's like a, a whole completely different um, environment. Mm, absolutely, I mean. Yeah, it, the problem, and I'm sure you can also to relate to this, but with photography, there's always something else you want to get. So from my Canon S95, I went to my first um, DSLR camera, which was um, the Canon um, D500, 500D. 500. So my first underwater DSLR was the Canon 500D. Okay. And with that came the different lenses, a different housing, different strobes. And, you know, as you progress more, it does become expensive. But yeah, you can, I... you can, sorry, you can actually take really good pictures with a cheap camera. And all you need to know is how to use it. So I've seen people with really expensive cameras not knowing how to use them and taking mediocre shots. Whereas I've seen people with, probably a, a cheaper camera like an Olympus TG5 or TG6 taking outstanding photos because they know how to use their camera. So I think it all boils down to what you want out of your underwater photography and how you know your camera and what you can get out of your camera. Yeah, the, the, the bottom line is you've got to start. That's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. Once you start, then, then you're, you're in. And uh, you can progress from there. You know, the, the, that's a that's, uh, hurdle of, um, oh, I don't know, what if, what if, what if. Um, you know, even if you buy, uh, the, you know, something really, really cheap um, to, to get into it, uh, start seeing how you enjoy it and, and then go from, uh, from there. I think that's, that's the important thing. Just start. Absolutely. And once you've taken that step, I promise you it's addictive. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so there, that would be, you know, the, 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 the photographers have a, uh, saying that we've got gas, gear acquisition syndrome. So this would be underwater gas. <laughs> oh, I haven't heard that one. That's haven't you? Country. Haven't you? Yeah. We've, um, for those who, who are um, interested um, on the Hunters of Light uh, website, just like this one, the smile and I might flash you, we've also got um, a gas, a got gas uh, merchandise. So head on onto the store, go and uh, order a T-shirt. Uh, you won't be sorry. All right, so let's uh, let's get into some of your your images. I, um, uh, as I said, we've we've uh, we've had one um, one or two people uh, talking about underwater photography, um, but uh, I'm really excited to to see what images you've got. Um, from what I've seen so far, they are spectacular. So yeah, let's let's get into it. For me, what underwater photography is all about is your own personal translation of what you see under the water. And I absolutely love this, step, this saying by Henry 
Thoreau, the question is not what you're looking at, but what you see. And I think that's what make, makes people's photography and underwater photos and photos in general all unique because everybody sees things differently. Um, so, yeah, photography for me is just a way of expressing myself and how I see things underwater. So this first photo that I'm showing you here is actually a dwarf anemone. And I just saw this. It was on hanging on a reef. And I just saw it and I thought, gosh, that looks just like two hands interclasped. And I just I set my lighting up just to, to light up the, the hands and to give a black background. And, and it, it just came out as, as what I saw as, as hands and not um, an anemone. It is funny. It's the first thing that uh, that I saw was uh, was the hands, you know. And then you go, hold on, there's too many fingers there. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so I think when you when you do start underwater photography, it's really important to to look at other people's work um, and to see what inspires you um, and what you like, and try to make that your own. Um, so. As I mentioned earlier, I did start off with a Canon S95 and progress to um, a crop sensor Canon um, DSLR. And my last camera before the one I've got now was the Canon 7D Mark II, which is really the camera that, that I kind of came into my own with. And I'm very fond of that camera. Um, when I got my Nikon D850, I kept my, my Canon. I couldn't bear to part with it. And I gave everything to my husband. So, so no pressure, Dion. You've got to take good pictures now. Um, there we go. You, you, you've, you've set a precedent. Um, and now he's uh, just got to pick it up and go from it. No, don't drop the ball. Just make sure it's same quality, <laughs> et cetera. But it's, you know, it's, and, and the thing is, you know, he, he has his own style. And in fact, he started taking photos long before me. And he was the one that encouraged me. So, with his, he's also very artistic. So yeah, it, it was a great pleasure to be able to to give that to him and for him to to take his underwater photography one step further too. But yeah, so my equipment is is the Nikon D850, which I got in December last year. And the great thing about that is that you can use a 60, the Nikos, Nikon, sorry, the Nikko 60 mm um, macro lens with this camera which is great for me because underwater here, you can get quite a bit of surge. So it's quite difficult to keep the camera still. So if you have the 60 mil, you can actually get a wider field of view and it's easier to get what you're taking a photo of into the frame and in focus. Um, and I also uh, have just a, a, a question on that. I mean, you're talking about the surge, et cetera. Um, <laughs> Obviously, when you go down, uh, you know, uh, at, to any depth, really, you're going to start losing light uh, fairly quickly. Um, I would assume that, uh, you know, there's not, uh, with the, the strobes, there's not as much of an issue with, um, you know, camera shake, etc., because you, you're freezing the, uh, the moment. But I suppose the, that, that surge, um, uh, you know, if you've, if you've got that 105 on there um, and you're moving backwards and forwards, even by a millimeter or two, uh, you know, something that was in focus, uh, you know, the, 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 the tip of the nose is uh, now somewhere in the, the middle of the body, I would assume. <laughs> yes, um, the 105 mil is a brilliant lens. But yeah, as you say, it, it's really um, challenging to use underwater when you do have surge. And as you know, water is an ever moving thing, even if the, the sea looks flat, it there is motion. So yeah, one of the challenges in underwater photography is is getting your focus on exactly the right point um, that you want to, it to focus on. So holding yourself still in the water is, is pretty difficult. So what we tend to do is we might put a finger on a bare rock, which is close to the subject, so that you don't disturb the creatures around you or the marine life around you, but you can still hold yourself quite steady. Um, yeah, it's it, it's challenging, you know, and and not every day is flat like a mirror. We have swells that we have to to can to um, to deal with, and yeah, but yeah, with the strobes, it does freeze motion to a certain extent. Um, the fastest shutter speed that I can actually use with the strobes is one over two fifty, um, which is pretty fast. So we're quite lucky with the strobes. It does it does 
slow and stop the blur quite a bit. Okay. Yeah, and then my lovely red housing, that's um, a nice lot of housing. It's made in Italy. Um, we're the agents for those housings, and I've used different housings, and this is the most beautiful. It is the easiest to use. The buttons will work. Really important in underwater photography when you, when you want to move your focal point around, that you can do that, and the housing just allows you to, to move that around like so slickly. Um, so I'm very happy with my housing, which I also got in December. And those strobes are new strobes that I've just um, got. And, yeah, I, I haven't used them yet. Um, so I'm, I'm dying to test them out. And, yeah, and another important thing when you're taking macro photos is to have a focus light. So I use this the torch focus light, which helps light up your subject. And by doing so, it helps your camera see the contrast. And if your camera can see the contrast, it's easier for it to focus more quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, it was one of the things I was going to ask, you know, you uh, certain cameras will, will focus in, 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 you know, quite low light, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the deeper you go underwater, I think that, um, that light just gets less and less and less. And, and, uh, you know, I, I was just wondering if, uh, if there was a way, but that, that makes perfect sense because now you've got the contrast you need, um, that autofocus should lock on, uh, perfectly. Yes, and it normally does. Um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting because it's quite a strong focus light, but because the strobes are so much brighter, you don't get any hot spots from the light of the focus right. light because the strobes will completely overpower that. So it's not anything that you really need to worry about. Um, and then, yeah, other things that I use, and I can show you a little bit later, are things like snoots, which channel the beam of the, the strobe light to... A couple of millimeters so that you can just light your subject and then i also use diopters which are like magnifying glasses that you screw onto the front of the housing and it just helps you magnify those tiny little nudibranchs that are a couple of millimeters in size so it's a lot of equipment um, you don't need all of this you can just use a tg5 a tg6 and you'll still get really good pictures um, but as you all Underwater photography career blossoms, and I hope it does. Um, you will probably find yourself getting something similar to this. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the the, the evolution. Um, you know, you starting off with something that um, that you you're just messing around with. Uh, you need to get a slightly better camera. Uh, got to now now I need a, a you know the strobes, and then you realize right, I've got to sell one of the children because <laughs> I need a, I don't know, I start to housing. Uh, the strobes, etc. Yeah, my kids have left home. Been <laughs> so I have a little bit more money available. Um, and also because I do a lot of photography for magazines and things like that, um, I do need to be able to produce high resolution images, which Wishes camera is able to do. No, absolutely. I mean, if it's um, it, you know, if it's a hobby, it's one thing. But uh, you know, if you're shooting for clients and and they're paying for it, um, yeah. you know, you just you've got to. It's the same as um, you know, on on land uh, photography, where you know, quality is is what you're looking for, uh, and um, that's that's all about the professionalism of it. It is. It is. Um, and there are lots of challenges. You know, apart from hoping that you've got a good day to go diving, that you're going to see the creatures that you want to see and that all your equipment works on with water. You have things like surge and also what we call backscatter to contend with. And backscatter is when your strobes light up the tiny particles of sand or plankton or marine debris in the water. And that shows up on your photos as snow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, st strobe positioning is also really important to, to try and minimize backscatter. But even in the clearest of water, if you go to the Red Sea and you dive there and it looks completely clear and you can see for 40 meters, um, you will still get backscatter because there is natural sediment in the water. So it's all about strobe positioning um, and settings to try and to minimize that as much as possible. Practice, practice, practice. Yes, it's all about practice and, and you know, it, you've got to enjoy what you do because if you get frustrated, 
you could give up, but the more you practice, the easier it does become. So, yeah, get past that. Get past the challenges. Don't go back and do video like I did. Just persevere, read, practice, and practice, and you will get there. No, that's great. So the practice, uh, the, pro the process for me is, is what you like. And don't be afraid to experiment and to develop your own style. Um, so when I first started dabbling in underwater photography, I spent a lot of time on social media and on the internet, looking at underwater photos, seeing what I liked um, and wondering how I could do something similar. And I think we all start out looking at pictures that we like and trying to replicate replicate them but I think it's really important to develop your own style because otherwise you're not going to stand out um, your photos are going to look just like everybody else's so a lot of people that influence and I'm I just want to mention some of the people who influenced me because they really did have a good a great impact on on the photos that I take and it's quite interesting. I, I sat down last night and I looked at the people who, who had the most influence on my photography. And it's a lot of photographers from the East, a lot of Asian photographers. Um, I loved the black backgrounds and the colours and um, people like Ajix Dharma, Lillian Ko, Violet Ting. They all used light in a creative way. And that's something that really inspired me in my photography. <coughs> Sorry. So, so as far as the creative um, use of light, those were influences and inspirations to me. And then more of sort of more creative underwater photography. I went to the Philippines and I stayed at a place called Anilao. And I met an amazing photographer called Patrick Ong. And he introduced me to this incredible underwater photography technique called, well, it's nothing new. I mean, I, knew, I know land photographers use it and macro photographers on land use it too, um, reverse ring macro. So that is the photo that I've taken on the right-hand side there where I took a normal 60 mil lens, put it on my camera, and then reversed a very old 50 mil um, Ricoh lens on that. And, and, and then I used artificial light, colored gels, and created some different colors. And that was one of the techniques that I really like. Sure, that's very interesting. And that, and that fits it, um, in your underwater housing? Yes. So I've got ports and extensions, and I just put some in extensions in between the housing and the port, um, which gave me more space to, to put the lenses in inside. So the only thing that happens there is that I wasn't control in control of the aperture. So right. I had set the ISO and I had set um, the shutter speed, but aperture is paper, paper thin. So you can see the rhinophore, which is the yellow and white key up things um, at the front of the nudie brank, those are the rhinophores. Um, I think the front one is in focus slightly, but the other one isn't because I think the the focal focal point was probably f one point eight wow. or something like that. <clears throat> and yeah, with the with the surge, it's also very difficult to to actually press the shutter at the right time and make sure what you want to be in focus is in focus. I think, I think it's really, I think it's beautiful. Thank you. I spent a whole summer just practicing um, reverse ring macro, um, but there's a lot of, of room for improvement still. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, if we can look at the different styles of macro, um, so the standard style of macro is just getting as much as you can in focus, getting as much as you can sharp. And to do that, you can use a 60 mil macro lens. You can use any compact camera. Um, you can use 105, 100 mil, whatever camera you're using. But the most important thing with standard macro is to try and get as much as you can in focus and in sharp. 
So what you do there is your settings would be your lowest possible ISO, like ISO 100, um, a fast shutter speed, um, probably 1 over 160 to 1 250, which is the fastest most underwater cameras can do to sync with their strobes, and then a nice high aperture. Now, this is, I think, where quite there's quite a difference between land photography and underwater photography is we... We set our ISOs, but we also set very close apertures. So for a standard macro shot like this, you would probably use anything from F16 on a crop sensor, F18 upwards for a full frame um, camera. And a compact camera, you would use your highest ISO, I'm sorry, your highest aperture. Sure. Yeah, I suppose the the you know that is quite a, a difference. And I mean, for me, I I prefer to shoot wide open. So that, that certainly wouldn't help me at all, um, because I suppose wide open might be considered to be like an f eight, uh, but even that might be too uh, too wide to get uh, very much in there. If you had on if you had f eight, you would probably get the eyes in focus and those eyebrows sticking up at the top. Yeah, and maybe. Pop his nose, I don't know if you would get his mouth in focus. Um, with a crop sensor, you might, you will get more in focus than a, than a full frame sensor. And a, yeah, on a, on a um, compact camera F8, you will get it like this. So yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I love, I love how the different settings are so different um, between land and underwater, for, uh, underwater photography, um, which is why I can't take photos on land. <laughs> no. I do the settings. It's like I just put the put the ISO on auto and <laughs> hope for the best. Um, so yeah. So one of the things I love about underwater photography is to capture the personalities um, on the reef, and that's why macro photography really does appeal to me. Um, yeah, I, I just there's lots of little fish like this. There's, there's two eyed two eyed blenny. And they're so cute. And if you can just get them to trust you and let them give give them time to relax in your in your company, they will sit there and they will watch you. And then you can wait and wait until they look at you and then press the shutter. So the best thing is to try and wait until you can get eye contact, um, because everybody seems to to look at eyes, whether you're looking at a person or a fish or a rhinophore of an, a nudibranch, everybody looks at the eyes first. So, yeah, I just think macro photography is amazing. It's, it's showing these little creatures and their little personalities. I agree. So <clears throat> in Gordon's Bay and in Falls Bay, we have a lot of nudibranchs. So nudibranch actually means naked gill. Um, and nudibranchs breathe by filtering out the air in the sea, and they do that through gills, like fish do. And there are so many different nudibranchs in false bay. I think, and I stand under correction, I think there's about 70 different nudibranchs. Sure, that's, that's so, amazing. Yeah, so we have lots to, sh to choose from, um, lots of different types. It's fun to look for them. Um, yeah, in Gordon's Bay, there really are a lot of different types of nudibranchs and not just one or two. There are so many. So you'll go on a dive and you might see 15 different types of nudibranchs, but you probably see 15 of each different type. Um, they, it's, it's really amazing. I went to Lembe, which is supposed, well, sorry, how am I say supposed to? It is known as the crit critter capital of the world. And I was expecting to see loads of nudie ranks absolutely everywhere. And then I realized that, no, Gordon's Bay is the crit critter capital of the world because there were so many here um, than they were there. And it was quite amazing. So I hope lots of photographers come here and, re you know, and see all the amazing nudie ranks we have because we really are the critter capital of the world um, from what I've seen. Have but you yeah, photographed so all of them? No. <laughs> That's a never-ending challenge. I mean, some are so well camouflaged that they're very difficult to find, and some are easier to see. Um, this one was, and some are very small. This one was probably about two centimeters long, and it was sitting on a shell. 
Um, so you can get very tiny ones that are probably a couple of millimeters long, and then you can get some that grow up to about 10 centimeters. Um, so that's why the 60 mil macro is also my favorite because you can photograph all the sizes of nudibranchs without having to back off too far because the working distance right. of the 100 mil or 105 mil macro is so long. And underwater, the further you are away from your subject, the more water there is between you and your camera and your, your subject. <clears throat> so, yeah, so it can, it's much easier to get as close as possible and to fill the, the frame with your subject, which I do with the 60 mil and different diopters. So you really, with a 60 mil macro, you can get really close to your subjects. And with the help of a diopter, which is a magnifying glass that you put on the end of your housing, it helps to magnify your subjects too. So this one was shot using my um, Nikon D850. I was using 60 mil macro with a diopter of a strength of plus 12.5. So that's, that's quite a strong diopter. It magnifies things quite well. But as you start magnifying things, your depth of field becomes much shallower. So as you can see, as you look further back towards the end of the nudibranch, further back, less is in focus. So what we try to do is always get the rhinophores in focus. So the rhinophores are those two white um, things that are sticking up like horns. Right. Those are known as the, those are known as the rhinophores, and they kind of take the place of the eyes of fish. So when you take photos of nudibranchs, you always want the rhinophores to be in focus. Um, so yeah, with the surge, you have to make sure that you press the button at the right time so that your focal point is directly on those rhinophores, um, especially when you're, you've got such high magnification. That's a great tip. And yeah, shutter speed, I normally shoot at 1 over 250. And ISO, I normally have as low as possible. So that would be 100 or even lower, 64. Um, this is another photo that's taken. This one I use my Canon 7D Mark II. I was in Anilao in the Philippines, um, where I met an amazing underwater photographer, very influential, had a huge impact on my underwater photography. His name's Tim Ho. And he owns Anila Photo Academy. And I felt like I was in a, a rut in my photography. I was probably just taking standard macro shots. All my photos were photos, but they weren't, they were, I felt bored with, with my photos. I, I just felt I needed to do something more interesting. So I went to Anilao and I met Tim Ho and he told me what I needed to do. And one of the things he, he introduced me to, and which I had been dabbling a bit in, in before I went to Anila, was shallow depth of field, wide open apertures. And yeah, just to, to separate your subject from the background, there's two ways of doing that. You can do it with light separation by channeling your light, or you can do it with um, contrast separation by using different depths of field, different f-stops. So this is kind of one of my favorite photos from that trip to, to meet Tim was having the shrimp in focus and then creating kind of a depth of field with a, an op a wide open aperture. And I think this photo, it, it was one of my turning points. It was taken at 1 to 50th, um, ISO 100, and probably five f five point six. Um, so this was kind of the turning point of, of of my photography career. I don't even know if it's a career, but my photography journey was was just taking things one step further and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone of of taking photos that were safe with safe f stops, safe apertures, um, shutter speeds, and ISOs. So yeah, that's this is the turning point for me. I think. <laughs> I love the separation um, that it, it has with uh, with some of the elements in the background, but I think it also uh, with the, the the shallow depth of field, it also makes a difference when the subject is uh, is side on and you don't have a, a you know a, a long body that goes behind the the head. Uh, you know, t when it's side on, it's, you can obviously with that shallow depth of field get the whole body in uh, in focus. 
that's it. And that's one of the things that Tim taught me. Um, yeah, you know, you focal, hold your camera um, parallel, I think parallel perpendicular, you know, so the, the, the lens of your camera is parallel to your subject so that your depth of field and your focal plane are on your subject so that the whole of that subject on the side is, is completely in focus. Um, and you can see the, the bit of the, the whip fan in front of, of the, the shrimp is slightly out of focus because he, it was closer to me than, than, than the shrimp was. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's all about depth of field and, and what you have on that focal plane um, being in focus. Um, yeah, this is a standard macro photo of one of my favorite subjects. It's a basket star. And it's a type of starfish that you find on a number of the reefs in Gordon's Bay. And we actually discovered a dive site 11 kilometers out of Harbour Island, which is where you launch in Gordon's Bay. And when we got down there, there were all these sea fans. And they were covered in these little basket stars. And when we came up, we just couldn't believe what we'd seen. It was amazing. They are so detailed and so intricate. And what they do is they take their arms and they, they spread them out. And they capture little marine debris and little particles in the water, which they then eat with those arms as they're outfilled. So they're not particularly outfilled, but it gives you an idea of, of what they look like. And when we came up, we said, gee, what are we going to call this reef? You know, there's so many little sea stars there, so many basket stars. So we came, came on the name of Sterekis, which means little stars in Afrikaans. Um, yeah, so it's it's always difficult to know if you find a new reef what you're going to call it. But this, so hopefully the starfish from the the basket stars will stay there. Yeah, <laughs> the otherwise you'll have to change the name back to something else. <laughs> I know there was one reef that that we discovered and we decided we we're going to call it Octopus's Garden, and then we thought, no, you know, what if the octopuses aren't there next time? So hopefully the the basket stars will be there for a long time, which they have been. So yeah. And this is, again, just a, a standard macro photo, um, 1 over 250, F18, ISO 100. Um, with the strobes, I will have used two strobes, one on either side of the housing, just to, to light up the subject evenly like that. Right, so going on from, from macro, you also do super macro underwater. And... What we use are the diopters that I mentioned earlier, which are strong magnifying glasses that you put in front of, of the lens on the outside of the housing. So you can put it on and take it off um, whilst you're, you're diving. So this is a tiny little amphipod. It's probably about two millimeters long. And you need, first of all, you need really good eyesight to see them because they're hopping around on the reef like little fleas. Yeah. And once once you see them, you have to kind of follow them around um, through your viewfinder until you find one that's in the right position and then press your button and hope that the shutter fires at the right time that he's kind of looking at the camera. Um, so this is what I did with this one. I took it with my D850 um, ISO 100. Um, shutter speed was 1 to 50th and... F-stop, because the diopter gives you such shallow depth of field, um, I had it on F25. So <clears throat> there's, a, you know, there's a fine line between how high you can push that F-stop before you start getting chromatic aberration. Um, so that's, that's also one of the challenges that we have in underwater photography is, you know, what aperture can you push it to, especially with super macro, to get your subject in focus. Yeah, I think those those sorts of things are, are magnified when um, when it comes uh, to shooting underwater because it's not it's not like when you have uh, you know on land you do you don't have anything between you and the uh, uh, the actual subject um, you know uh, underwater you've got uh, the, the that that body of water you've got whatever's floating in it uh, etc that's that's going to try and upset the the you know the clarity of that image. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, that's what makes it fun and challenging. I mean, if, if, it, was, if it was easy, it would be boring. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things you have to take into consideration. But when you get the shot, it, it's really, it's worth all that 
being bashed around by surge and lots of out of focus images. So, you know, it, it, it's really fun. And I think that that's what keeps me going is, you know, always trying to take new photos, trying to capture the perfect shot of that anthropod or that perfect photo of a nudibranch or find a nudibranch that you've never seen before and really try to capture it well. So, yeah, underwater photography is is addictive and it's it's really fun. It does sound like a lot of fun. Especially macro. It is. Um, this is a, a tiny, tiny um, candy crab um, that I, I took when I was in Lembe in, in, the, in um, Indonesia. And oh, I'd wanted to take a photo of one of these little crabs for absolutely ages. And there you dive with a dive guide and you say, oh, I'd really like to see X, Y, and Z. Um, no pressure, but if you can find it for me, I would be really happy. Thank you very much. And um, I said, oh, um, I'd, I'd really like to see this candy, this candy crab. And we were just finishing a dive and the mooring line that the boat was, was tied to had this beautiful pink soft coral on it. And the dive guide called me over and there was this pink soft coral bobbing up and down in the water. And he pointed to this tiny thing that I could hardly see. It must have been probably not even three millimeters in size. Sure. And I knew it was, I knew it was, I knew it was a candy crab. And this pink soft coral was bobbing up and down. And I had a hundred mil lens on <laughs> and a dive. And to find this thing, first of all, through the viewfinder was so difficult. And, you know, you're not really supposed to hold on to anything. But luckily there was um, a bare piece of rope that I was able to kind of hang on to. So I was hanging onto the rope with one arm and holding my camera with the other and trying to look through this view, viewfinder. And I have a magnifying viewfinder, for which it goes on the back of my housing, which helps me see a bit better. But it's a 45-degree viewfinder. So... It's not like you're looking straight through through the viewfinder of your your camera. You're actually looking down, so you have to tilt the camera up a bit. And it was so difficult to find this candy crab, but I finally found it. And I took a couple of pictures, and then it was time we really had to go. So I was really lucky to find it, and really lucky to actually get most of it in focus. But yeah, you know, it's 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 all about the challenge and and trying to get the shot that you want. Um, in underwater photography. Uh, that's a great story. I, I think the, you know, there's behind every uh, photograph, there's a story of, uh, you know, uh, what it took and how someone was hanging by three fingers, <laughs> putting the camera around a, a you know, a, a rock face, etc. So, but that, but that, as you say, I mean, that's the, that's the, 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 the beauty of it, trying to uh, obviously find uh, these new uh, creatures, but also, uh, you know, trying to take a better shot of it, um, you know, if you if you do see them again. Yeah, absolutely. And I did see them again um, later on in the trip. And I was able to, but they, they were bigger. So they were easier to photograph. Um, and I think what's really important to, to point out in underwater photography is if your creature's not pointing in the right direction, if it's not in the right place, move on and find another one. Because... For me to, and I do know it happens probably more in the East where people go on holiday, they've got a long list of things they want to see, the dive guides are, are desperate to please them and they will point, you know, take a pointer and move the critter so that it's in the right position or on the right, on a beautiful background. And I think that, you know, it's really important as underwater photographers that we don't encourage that, that we discourage that kind of, behavior um, because we don't want to harass the marine life because you know they can die and they could get injured if you just want to move something to take the perfect shot and there'll always be another one so move on take a photo by all means but move on and find another one because one day you will find that perfect nudibranch or crab in the perfect position for you to take a photograph of it's for me that's something I'm very passionate about so this is this is another photo that I took um, when I was in Anilao using a very shallow depth of field. And I think it was on the first dive that I did there. And I'd been dying to see this thing called a hairy shrimp. 
but I had absolutely no idea. I've seen photos like this. I'd seen them on the internet. I'd seen them on Facebook. I had no idea how big they were. Because if you look at a picture like this, you think, gosh, that thing's like five centimeters or it's 10 centimeters. It must be huge because that's what macro photography does is it makes you think that everything is super big. When, you know, as underwater photographers, we're taking a photo of something that's two millimeters and on the screen, it looks like it could be 20 centimeters. Um, and I think, you know, people, people don't realize how small things are until they actually see them. And that happened to me because I knew that the dive guide had found me a hairy shrimp. I don't know how, but I just knew. And he was pointing to this stalk with this little umbrella looking thing on the top. And I could see this white thing. Um, and at that stage, I didn't have my magnifying viewfinder. So I was looking through the camera's viewfinder. And I could see this white thing on the top of this green stalk. And I thought, oh, that white thing, it's a hairy shrimp. Oh my gosh, it's wonderful. So I took the photos, I was all excited. And when I got back and I looked on my computer, I realized that yes, I'd taken a photo of a hairy shrimp, but the white thing had been the hairy shrimp, the pink <laughs> thing. <there. laughs> you know, it's 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 quite amazing how you have these preconceived ideas in your mind of how big something is. And there me, I'd been looking at this tiny white thing thinking that was the hairy shrimp. But lo and behold, the pink thing was. And I hadn't even seen the pink thing. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> it really is. Um, so yeah, it's 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 really exciting to to go out and, and take macro photos because you never know what you're gonna come back with like this one. <laughs> That's great. And then yeah, uh, the the shallow depth of field. This is something I really really love. Um, it's it show it, it it allows you to highlight certain parts of your subject. So this photo is a feather duster fan worm, which is a spiral looking thing. And if you look at it from the side, it looks like a Christmas tree. Um, and I had my Canon 7D Mark II. It was photo photographed in Anilau again. Um, I had my 100 mil macro lens on and I was told wide open, open as wide as you can. And that was f2.8. And you know, I really, really only got a tiny little bit of the subject in focus, but it really made the nice bokeh background, the, the smooth um, background because of the shallow depth of field. And I think that is that is one thing that the 100 mil and the 105 mil macro lens gives you is this amazing buttery bokeh backgrounds um, with the shallow depths of field, which, which I absolutely love. This is something that is probably one of the techniques that I've found that I like doing the most. Yeah, I think the thing with that is that it, it, it takes it from, uh, you know, a more standard looking uh, shot to, to something that's, that's really uh, more artistic and, and where, where people would want to hang it in their, um, uh, you know, in their homes. Uh, that's, that's my uh, take on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, f I find it very difficult to take those standard macro photos, um, I have to take them because, you know, for the magazines that I write for, I have to show photos of the things on the reef where I'm diving. Um, but it's nice to throw in a couple of photos like this too into the articles, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. And if you look, look at social media and you post a photo like this, it might get something like 100 likes. But if you post a photo of a blenny that's completely in focus and it's cute and it's cheeky, you probably get 500 likes. So I think what's really, really important is to take photos that you like. And if other people like it, that's great. I think it's so important to decide what you like and what makes you happy. Mm, um, I agree with that. And if, if other people, it depends, you know, if you're trying to sell a print and somebody wants a photo of a shark or somebody wants a photo of a certain fish and they want it in focus and do it. Of course, we all we all want to make money out of photography, but if you're doing it for yourself, do what you love. Um, another um, shallow depth of field, separating the subject from its background, because underwater, the photograph the the background is is very busy, um, and it's not always complementary to your subject. Um, as you can see, not all this nudie brank is in focus. I just love to get the eyes, which is a little black spot there beneath the horns, which are called rhinophores. 
I really like to get that in focus. Um, and also, yes, I used a shallow depth of field <clears throat> with this, but I also used a diopter because he was so small. It was probably about half a centimetre long. So it's not perfect because I'm not head-on and I'm not side-on. So you can see that the, the blue bits at the front are in focus, but as you go back, they're not as in focus. Um, so, yeah, you can... Again, you know, people say to me, why is the whole nudie bank not in focus? I said, well, that's why I, this is how I wanted to shoot it. Um, so it's going back to the standard photos of the high apertures and then going to, to photos with a shallow depth of field, which which is, is probably not what everybody likes or expects yeah. from photography. It's that artistic versus, uh, you know, a technical image, you know, very different uh, yeah. approaches to it. Yeah, yeah, and and you might have noticed I love colour, so um, I tend to look for the more colourful things on the reef as well. There are also nudie banks which can look beautiful, but for me, I'm I'm addicted to colour. Um, this photo here is also shot using a very shallow depth of field. I used f five point six. I was use actually I also have a Sony A sixty four hundred in um, a polycarbonate housing made by Fantasy, um, which is very easy to travel with. So it's really light. And I used a Tuit, a Zeiss Tuit 50 mil macro lens for this shot, which is an amazing, amazing sharp lens for macro photography. Um, I love it a lot. Um, but I sold my housing to somebody because they were desperate for one and I wasn't able to get, I haven't been able to get a new one yet. So. It's, I'm still stuck with my D, D8, Nikon D850, which I love. But anyway, sorry, to get back to this picture, um, I used a torch as my lighting for this photo. So the focus light that I showed you at the beginning, that's quite a, it's quite a bright um, torch. So it was able to give me enough light to, to take this photo. It, I had my camera on f5.6. I had the aperture, it was 5.6, the shutter speed was quite slow. I think it was about one over one, one two five, which is probably the slowest you should go um, if you're using a torch because you don't have those strobes to freeze your motion. And ISO was probably about 300, 400, just to, to give a little bit more sensitivity to the light of the torch. So yes, you can use torches, um, you just have to understand the settings of your camera to get the right exposure. Now, this is my very, very favorite um, technique in underwater photography, which is using a snoot. And I do know that you use snoots in um, photography studios for lighting, um, for products and for, for portrait photos, um, but you can actually snoot your strobes to have a very, very narrow beam of light, which will then just light up your subject. So I have an adapter that goes on the front of my strobe that gives me a beam of anything from one centimeter to a couple of millimeters in diameter. And I will choose the beam width depending on my subject. So this is one of my very, very favorite um, subjects. It's the gas flame nudibranch. It's very common but they all photograph completely differently. It, it, it's really interesting. Some will be pastel colors, some will be luminous, some will be vibrant, some will be less vibrant. It's, it's incredible how the, um, the light can just change how these gas flame nudie banks look. I so think I it's lovely. This. Oh, thank you. So I shot this with my snoot and to get the black background, you want the fastest shutter speed you can get. So it would have been one, two, 50. Um, you also don't need to have a shallow depth of field. You want everything in focus. So this would have been about F18 and ISO 100. So the trick is to get the light to fall on your subject, which is very difficult um, because you have, to you have to focus your strobe directly at your subject in a moving environment. So it, it really is quite difficult, but once you've got it all lined up, 
and you're focusing on the nudibranch and the beam of your strobe is focusing on the nudibranch too, this is the kind of effect that you can get. No, I love it. I love the, the, the fact that the light is, is just on, you know, the, the front of it. Um, it just uh, makes it that much more spectacular. Yeah, I think it really does make the colours pop. And also, you know, the, our reefs are so vibrant as it is that you, it's nice to be able to separate your subject from its surroundings. Um, this photo I took the other day, and it's something that I've been trying to do for ages. Um, it's, you know, when you're a kid and you have a torch and you turn the lights off and you shine the torch up your chin and you, you like frighten your friends. Um, this is the opposite of that. It's the, the downward light rather than the upward light that we used to shine up on our faces when we were kids. And I just wanted to light the face of this Blenny. And he was so cute. He just sat there on the roof and waited and waited until I got my camera focused on him and the beam of my snoot over the top of his head. And yeah, it, it finally all came together and I got this picture. It's a bit of a grumpy old man portrait. Uh, oh, yeah, he is no very grumpy old man. He's got a, a, a very someone said someone said to me, he looks like he's he's sucking a lemon. And <laughs> someone else said to me, looks like he's puckering up for a kiss. So I said, Oh, I hope I didn't do that. <laughs> And kisses like that. So, yeah, it's like, you know, what we see, what do we see? Does he look like he's sucking a lemon or does he look like he's puckering up for a kiss? So it's 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 lovely to to get feedback on on how people see things. It's it's really it's very interesting. Um, this is a photo of a very tiny anemone. It's probably about one centimeter in diameter. And I snooted it from the top, but slightly from the back to give it a transparent um, effect. So you can see the little white things that are sticking at the, t at the top. Um, they're completely transparent. And then the pink of the actual anemones is also pretty transparent. And that's from putting your snoot slightly back past the subject and lighting it from behind. And it really helps to, to show the detail and the texture, which is another reason that I love macro underwater photography is it does show all of that. And yeah, I'm I'm not one for entering competitions. I I think it's it's a I don't know if it's subconscious, but I always forget to enter. So someone will remind me, oh please enter your photo in this competition. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it, and then I forget. Yeah. But I think it's because I'm 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 scared of failure, you know. And I think most of us are. And then someone said to me, listen, you've got to be in it to win it. So I entered this competition with this picture and it, it actually was placed. So there's kind of a moral to that story that you've got to be in it to win it. And just because you might be super critical of your photos, not everyone else is. I mean, I, I don't like my pictures and my husband says, we post this one, people will like it. And I go, what, this is boring. What about this yeah. one? And he'll say, no, they won't get it. You know, so again, it's, it's, we're super critical, but we also have to stick to what we enjoy and what we love. So Absolutely. my advice, my advice to anyone is enter photo competitions, just do it. You could be surprised. So I guess I should also try to do it a little bit more often. Um, <laughs> if, I know, you know you've got a macro photography competition running at the moment. So <laughs> everybody, I know there are, are underwater photographers who are members of your Facebook group. Guys, enter the competition. <laughs> there you go. The, the one thing about um, lighting that, uh, you know, people only really get later on in their, in their sort of lighting experience is backlighting. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the, the underwater photography that I have seen is, is predominantly... Uh, sort of more front on um, and then it starts getting better when it's side on um, because you know you start getting a bit more 3D feel to it but once you you put a light more from behind um, it's amazing that sort of translucence that uh, that uh, that is there and it doesn't feel like it's lit anymore um, and and that's the the beautiful thing with with light you know you you can really transform it from being something that's that's quite flat 
to, to something that feels like it's got a glow coming from inside it. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we all get in a rut of, our, of having strobes, either if we have one strobe above our housing or two strobes either side of our port. Um, it's really important to experiment. If it doesn't work, try something else. If it doesn't work, try it again. You know, have it's really, I think, you know, you always have these pictures in your head of what you want to do. And the opportunity doesn't always bring arise um, or bring itself to you. But as long as you have those images in your head of what you would like to do, when the um, occasion does arise, you know what you're going to do. You know what you want to do. You know what you need to do. So it's always important to, to think about possible shots that you could take. Exactly. Rather than go in and see what, you know, see what's down there and just take photos of it. Look at your lighting. Do side lighting. Do inward lighting. Do back, back lighting. Um, there's so many things that you can do to experiment. And exactly. I think that's, that's so important. And if you, if you also uh, sort of make a decision, today I'm, I'm, I'm going to be backlighting everything. Uh, you know, you you can then, uh, you know, d because that's the aim that you've that you've got. You can go in and 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 uh, you know, over a course of however long you're underwater, um, really start pushing that and seeing what um, what will uh, what will develop. And then on a, on a different day, you know, uh, one of the side lights is brighter than than the the other side light, and 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 you know, just work it um, as often as you can. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's it. If you if you go in, you've got so little time underwater. I mean, you know, the longest dives we can really do is 60 minutes. Um, and the shortest dives can be anything to 10, up to 10 minutes, depending on depth, because the deeper you dive, the less time you have available. Um, that's normal recreational diving with, with air in our cylinders. So if you've got a plan, go into the water with that plan. And just stick to that, whether you're going to be doing backlighting, side lighting, snooting, stick with the plan and just find, try to find subjects that you can, can do it with because not everything is suitable for backlighting or side lighting or yeah. snooting. Um, but, yeah, I think you, you, we need to be more focused when we go diving instead of just going around taking shots. Um, it's really the only way to, to progress with your underwater photography is, is to – Think about what you want to achieve and try to achieve that on that dive. So, yeah, don't be afraid to experiment. I can't remember who said this to me, but it was quite, I, I did this, I took this photo of this soft coral nudibranch, and this is a reverse ring macro uh, with 60 mil macro lens and the old Rico 50 reversed on it. And the, sh the depth of field was so shallow, but what I was after was this, um, it's like a tri trio plan bubble bouquet, um, but it's not. Um, it's just the effect that light had on the little details on the reef. It reflected off the little bits and made little circles like this because the, shallow, the depth of field was so shallow. Um, and I was pretty chuffed with this picture because I got the circles that I wanted and the color was interesting. And some of the, the details of the nudibranch were in focus. And I posted it on, on social media and someone wrote underneath, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, you know, I love feedback. And... Uh, if people don't give you feedback, you can't grow. But it doesn't mean to say that you have to agree with all the feedback. You exactly. Need to be your own. And this person hated it. Um, and I was so proud of it. And I didn't quite know what to think. Um, yeah, but, but that's just, you know, just experiment. And if you like it, don't worry about what anyone else thinks. You know, if you're happy with it, if you achieve what you set out to achieve, great. That's you, Your mission is complete. That's it. So, yeah, I love um, colour and I've been trying to get this technique perfected for about three years, four years now, where you snoot your subject so that you show its real colours, but you use a colour filter to light the background. And it should really be a complementary or, or a contrasting background. 
And I tried with torches and I bought um, colored gels that I put on my strobes and I just could not get it right. And then um, last year, one of the underwater photography um, manufacturers brought out a flash, a little flash with colored filters that they developed so that when you use the flash with those color filters, the colors were really bright like this. So the pink is the color filter and the white is a snoop. So I'm using two different lighting um, sources here. And eventually nice. I was able to get the technique that I wanted. But yeah, I had to wait for someone else to develop it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think it, uh, it just helps it stand out so nicely. Thanks, because yeah, it, it's a very plain colored nudie brank. It's also gas flame, but it's a, a salmon gas flame, which is a lot lighter. Um, and yeah, I, I took quite a few different pictures with different subjects and different color backgrounds because the torch comes with about five or eight different colors. So there's blues and greens and oranges and reds. So yeah, I'm looking forward to taking this back into the water and, and trying it again sometime soon. Um, yeah, we've touched on reverse ring macro. This is another one um, that I took. As you can see, the little horns, the rhinophores are, are barely in focus. And there was um, Patrick Ong, who I mentioned, I met in, in Anila. There's another um, underwater photographer called Imran Ahmed, and he's the pioneer of um, reverse ring macro underwater. And his, his work is really worth um, looking at. I used my Canon 7D Mark II with this and, and the 60mm and the 50mm lens. Um, I haven't tried it yet with my Nikon D850, and I'm very interested to, to find out what the results are going to be um, with the lenses that I have. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's also one of those things you either like it or you don't. Um, and I think this can there's still definitely room for improvement. I would like to get... A, 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 a more of a depth of field, get more in focus. And I, I know now how to do it, so I will go out and try it again. Yeah, it, it, for me, it pushes it, um, you know, into that realm of, um, of more artistic, uh, you know, fine art type um, images, which, which I really enjoy. And I think the, there's definitely a, 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 a market for, the, the, the images that are much more sort of technically accurate. Um, yeah. You know, this is the uh, the nudibranch in location, in situ. Uh, this is how it, it it sort of lives. Fantastic. And then here's, oh, man, look how beautiful this is. Look at the little smushy colors around the side. And, you know, that'll go nasty with my couch. No, no, seriously, back, back away from that. Um, you know, so uh, you know what I mean? It's... It, it, um, it's it's two different types of um, uh, or target audience or audiences, and I think um, there's there's room for for both of them. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, it's it's what you enjoy, and you can go and you can take your scientific shots or your your standard macro shot, and then you can go back and do the same thing, but with a reverse ring macro. Don't be frightened to to experiment and and try different things. I mean, this was also shot using um, coloured torches. So there was a red torch and a green torch. And when they merged together, the red and the green created this kind of like a yellowy mottled um, effect. So when the colors overlap, it also creates an amazing effect as well. Mm. That's lovely. And then, of course, there's the, the slow shutter speed, uh, which I am still working on. And, um, yeah, so this is a tubular hydroid. It's... I call them flowers of the ocean because they're really beautiful. And I just had my shutter speed pretty slow. It is one fifteenth of a second and a torch so that it didn't give that bam light from a snoot uh, or a, um, a strobe. And it just gave a soft light and a soft sort of blurry feel from having a, a slow shutter speed. Although I did have my ISO on about 100 and my aperture was also 5.6. So with the open aperture and the, the slow shutter speed, I had to be very careful about how much light um, I got on the subject. And I really enjoyed that, uh, that one, you know, the colors, the, 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 the softness of it. Um, I, it's, it's one of my favorites, I think. Thanks. 
I used a yellow torch and a and a pink torch for that. You can see the yellow on the top and the, yeah, the pink. Yeah. But, you know, it's so difficult to try and get those torches to hit exactly where you want because they're attached to your your housing. So yes. when you move your house closer to the subject, the torches kind of miss the subject. So you have to point them exactly where you want them to hit. And that, it's the same with the snoot. It's once it's lined up, it's fine, but to, to get it lined up, it's it's a super challenge. So these kind of phrases are kind of kind of, kind of uh, rewarding when they do work out. Absolutely. And then, I, and then I just wanted to share this picture with you. Um, I love to be able to take macro photos, but show the critter in its surroundings. So that's completely opposite of um, a snooted shot or a, a shot where you've you know you've got shallow depth of field and you can't see where where your critter is. You just highlighted the critter with your your f-stop and your your depth of field and your lighting um this photo was taken with my canon s95 which i still have and a lens that is called a bug eye lens it's not <laughs> the, it's not the lower one it's one that's manufactured by a company called enon and it just screws onto the front of my housing and it gives you this massive um field of view so like probably close to 160 degrees, sure. but you can focus on the actual um, lens of of the lens itself. So my lens was probably on this fish's nose. Um, and it gave me the opportunity to, to show you where he lives. He lives in the kelp forest and to show you him as well. So this is something that's also really interesting. It's the image quality, because it's the S95, is not super high. I think it's a 10 megapixel um, camera, but it's just I just love this the the setup. I love the the bug eye and and taking pictures like this too. Now it's it's one of those ones where you know for me it, the it's not um, it doesn't feel macro. Um, because of that, uh, that the perspective that you have, um, you know, I, I quite enjoy that. Just you can imagine that uh, it's quite a dark, uh, cold environment, and you know, there's the, the the waves and the surge coming through the the kelp forests. It's uh, it's pretty cool. I think you I think you uh, summarised it pretty pretty correctly there. I think it was cold and surgy and dark, and, <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's only. He's probably only about five centimeters in in size, so it's it's still macro. He's pretty yes. small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, those were those were really really cool. I really enjoyed uh, you know seeing them and, and also uh, you know seeing how how you uh, light them and the backlighting uh, for for one of them using the torches and even the the the, the apertures that uh, that you use. Um, you know, I I. On, on land, it's, as you said, it's 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 two different uh, two different beasts. Um, you know, I I want to try and, and and sort of blur those backgrounds if they're too busy or, or something like that. So I I, I sort of look at um, you know those uh, eyes. I mean those apertures and go, whoa, it's a it's a little it's a little too much detail for for me. Um, but the thing is, if you're that close, unless you do have those high apertures, um, you're not going to see enough detail. Uh, so, you know, you're still going to have uh, schmushy backgrounds, um, you know, but uh, whether you get, you know, the eyes or the fat lips in the front and, and no tail or whatever it is, um, you know, you, you, you still got different dynamics and, and different apertures and, and things like that. So it's, uh, I've, I've learned something and, and, and I think uh, everyone who's been watching this has certainly learned as well. Um, and that is is what the the hunters of light is 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 all been about since day one, you know. Inspire and and motivate and educate. And um, this is just another one of those uh, you know creative showcases that I think has done uh, just that. So you know, I, I really appreciate uh, you coming through and, and taking the time. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. I think I talked too much. I have you going a bit croaky? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I I, I love sharing tips and techniques with people to help them improve their underwater photography. So I really hope that, you know, people will be able to have taken something away, no matter how small, and it will help them with their photography too. And while the Hunters of Light, the Facebook page, the photos that I've seen have been such an inspiration to me, um, 
especially this month with the macro photos, mm. incredible, incredible work. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what else people post, especially with land and portrait and other types of photography so that I can learn from them too. And thank yeah. you for this amazing, amazing initiative that you, you set up. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's a, it's an absolute pleasure. You know, the, the, when, whenever I hear comments like that, um, about how, uh, you know, people have, uh, you know, benefited in, in, in some small way, that's really what, uh, what makes it all uh, worthwhile. I mean, it's a, it's a hell of a lot of work that, uh, that goes into it, but you know, the, there's certainly a, a, a reward from, from my point of view when, when, when I get that kind of feedback. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, no, well, and yeah, Thank you. And I want to see your images in the in the macro competition. So, you know, once we finished here, get there, put some photos up. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to start mm. nagging you. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll try to remember. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Kate. I, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll we'll pop on your social media links, etc. And if uh, people come down to uh, to the Cape, make sure that you uh, hook up with uh, with Kate. Um, let her guide you on some uh, some dives, some photographic dives, and um, yeah, support her. So I think her images are fantastic, and and there's a lot that she can teach us. So thank you, Kate. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Have a good one. You too.